It is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Vlad and Koten, our distinguished colloquial speaker. Uh, in my mind, uh, Vlad is the perfect example of a polymath in research. He has worked on many different research fields, and in each case, he had wild success. He worked on theoretical computer science, and he won the best paper award at Fox, uh, a most prestigious conference uh, on theoretical computer science. And he worked on computer graphics. And this year, he won the CGraph Test of Time paper award, which is the best kind of paper award one could hope to get. And he worked on machine learning. He won a best paper award in New Europe's. And uh, he worked on computer vision. And he has produced uh, many amazing results, including widely popular uh, tools, uh, including Open3D and Kala. I can go on and on, but the point is that uh, whatever he chooses to work on, he crushes it. I'm sure today will be no exception on uh, whatever he is going to talk about. Without much further ado, with Adam, please take it away. Thank you very much, Jira. Thank you for uh, inviting me. So today I want to talk about, uh, about robotics. And um, the message today that I want to convey is that over the past few years, the use of simulation and properly understanding the role of simulation has enabled breakthrough results in robotics to the extent that we can talk about a quiet revolution. Uh, it is perhaps quiet um, because uh, maybe it hasn't pierced the public consciousness to the extent that uh, events like ChatGPT have. But nonetheless, it is a revolution in the sense that we have produced results in robotics that have definitively shifted uh, the state of the art and have done so to an extent uh, that was perhaps unexpected, or if expected, would have been expected to come uh, quite a bit later. Uh, simulation has been a controversial topic in robotics for decades. And established researchers in robotics have cautioned away from the use of simulation and have cautioned against the use of Simulation, which is another reason to talk about a revolution, because the progress has come from going against a, a kind of grain uh, that was established in the field. And uh, the arguments against simulation have been so prevalent uh, and so common in robotics that I would like to start by talking through some of my favorite arguments against the use of uh, simulation in robotics and addressing them before I show you what we have been able to do as a result of harnessing simulation and understanding it is its proper role. So one classic argument against the use of simulation comes from uh, Rod Brooks. Here is uh, Rod in a paper that he co-authored with Maya Matarich 30 years ago, and I'll quote, there is great appeal to using simulated robots for investigating robot learning. Besides being affordable, simulations simplify the logistics of experimentation. However, relying on simulations can be dangerous, as they can inadvertently lead to the development and investigation of algorithms which are not transferable to real robots. Simulations are doomed to succeed. Even despite best intentions, there is a temptation to fix problems by tweaking the details of a simulation rather than the control program or the learning algorithm. To this, I can only say I agree. Rod is actually right. Understood in its proper context, he is warning about all the right things. It is very easy to become overly enamored uh, with uh, simulations. And 
there's a bit of a siren song where you start working in simulation and you kind of stay in simulation. Maybe there is some element of self-deception that creeps in um, because working in simulation is so convenient and you start adapting the simulations to the capabilities of your simulated systems and before you know it, it's time to retire uh, and you've done nothing uh, that has made any impact uh, in, uh, in the physical world. However, it's also easy to take uh, this cautionary note out of uh, context and get a little bit carried away in the other uh, direction. I've been told uh, by some old school roboticists that in some robotics labs, people printed this phrase, simulations are doomed to succeed on a large banner and hung it above, above their door frame to sort of remind themselves uh, how, uh, how bad simulations, simulations are. And I think that, that carries it a little bit, uh, a little bit too far. Uh, the real message is that you really must test in the physical world. Ultimately, the antidote to uh, self-deception and getting carried away with simulation is to deploy systems in the physical world. And the utility uh, of your simulation and uh, your use of simulation will be judged by the extent that you solve real robotics problems on real robots in the real world. And that's it. So simulations are useful if they enable you to make progress on real robotics problems with the real robots in the real world, which will be the general theme of my talk today. Here's another argument um, made uh, in, in, personal, uh, in, in personal communication by my former student, Sergei Levin. Um, why would it be easier to build a universe than to build a brain? Um, building a simulation is like building a universe. Why build a universe? Uh, why would it be easier than building a brain? Universes contain brains, so they must be uh, strictly more complex. I have a tremendous respect for, uh, for Sergei, um, but this argument is, is delightfully, deliciously wrong. Um, it really is the case that it's easier to build a universe than it is to build uh, a brain because brains aren't built. We can instantiate a universe based on fairly simple, well-understood physical principles, mostly boiling down to Newtonian mechanics. So we can basically build a universe from our understanding of Newtonian mechanics and what is by now fairly well understood, fairly basic uh, computational science and methods that have been developed uh, for efficient simulation in computational science and fields like uh, computer graphics. And these are all things that you will learn um, in a good computer science degree. So if you do a comput uh, computer science degree, slanted towards uh, numerical methods and computational science, uh, you, will, you will learn everything you need to know to build a universe uh, by, uh, by the time you graduate. Whereas you will not be able to build a brain, and no one will be able to build a brain because brains are not built. Brains are wired through experience with the external world. So to this day, if you asked me or anyone else to build a brain, we wouldn't be able because we don't have an existence proof and brains aren't built. Whereas we actually can build a universe within which a brain can be wired by experience uh, with its environment. There's a third argument against um, the adoption of, uh, of, uh, of, of simulation and giving it a central role uh, in, uh, in robotics. This was made by Oliver Brock uh, in, uh, in an email debate that a number of uh, my colleagues and I participated in. Uh, and, th and this is quite an arresting uh, argument. This is my favorite one, uh, so I will spend some time on it. The argument roughly is as, uh, as follows. 
the universe computes. Um, what does it compute? It computes its next state by integrating its dynamics, its laws of motion. So the universe can be regarded as a computer, uh, as, a, as a computational device that takes its current state, um, integrates forward its laws of motion to produce the next state. Now, what is doing the computing? What are the computational elements? It's, it's the particles. Uh, the particles of the universe each act as a computational element that has its current state, um, integrates the state from its neighbors and other particles uh, that must be taken into account uh, in, its, uh, in its dynamics. It integrates forward its, uh, its laws of motion to produce its next state. Now, the computational power of this device, of this computing machine, scales with the number of particles. It essentially scales with the spatial extent, with the window of space that you consider. So as you consider a small window of space, a small footprint, you will be looking at a certain computational capacity. When you scale that out and take into account more and more and more and a larger and larger and larger spatial extent, the amount of computational capacity, the amount of power uh, you will be considering will scale linearly. Okay. Think of all the sand in a, in a sandy beach. Each grain of sand can be regarded as a particle. Uh, and as, as, as such, it has certain computational capacity. It will compute its next state. So to simulate uh, that sandy beach, um, the more beach you have, the more beach you need to simulate, the more computational power you need to expend. Okay? And as you look out, as you expand your horizon, your, uh, your footprint of the part of the universe uh, that you consider, you will invariably exceed the power of any computing device we have. Because any computing device we have has finite computational capacity, whereas the universe, by this logic, um, ex ex grows in uh, computational complexity with extent. And we just don't have any computing machine that has this property, therefore, the physical universe will exceed the computational capacity of any computing machine that we can build. Therefore, we cannot simulate the universe. Therefore, robots should be trained in the physical world because the physical world is the only thing that has the computational capacity to represent itself. We basically cannot simulate the universe at sufficient fidelity to train our robots. The universe is the only simulation uh, that, uh, that can represent uh, itself. I, so this, this, this is an interesting and, 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 and deep uh, and, and, and somewhat, somewhat arresting um, argument. So I will, I will give a couple of answers uh, to it. Uh, at, at heart, the flaw in this argument, and, and the flaw is actually subtle. The argument is not obviously wrong. Uh, okay, it, it's, the, the refutation ultimately is empirical. Okay? Uh, the conceptual argument for how Brock's argument could be wrong is that we may not need uh, to simulate the universe at full fidelity. That is, training robots in simulations that are qualitatively simpler than the physical world may be sufficient for deriving robot brains, robot control policies that function essentially arbitrarily well in the physical world. So that's a non-trivial empirical claim. It is absolutely not obvious. So if robots in the physical world need to come into contact with liquids, uh, with deformable solids, with granular media, 
with non-Newtonian fluids, it's not obvious at all that our simulations don't need to represent liquids and non-Newtonian fluids and deformable media and deformable terrain uh, and granular media. And all those tricky things, like sandy beaches, uh, that we just don't have the computational uh, power to uh, simulate at full fidelity. It's actually not obvious that we don't need to do that. But the conceptual hope is that indeed we don't, that we can train in qualitatively simpler simulations for which we have enough, uh, enough computing, computing power. And ultimately, uh, the evidence for this is empirical. And that's what I, the main thing I hope to convince you of today. And that is, uh, uh, that, that is really the main thrust of uh, the revolution uh, that I want to, uh, uh, to present to you today, is that indeed, I, I'd say at this point, we have conclusive proof that um, we can train robots in qualitatively simpler simulations that are just qualitatively simpler than the physical world and obtain physical systems uh, obtain policies that work on real robots uh, that function in the physical world and function at a level of engagement with precisely the phenomena that we didn't simulate um, that at this point is very hard to argue with. Okay. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll point that out uh, during, during the talk when this, when this comes up. Here's another answer, counter argument to, uh, uh, to Brock's argument, which is that an animal brain and body is also a finite, finite capacity computational system, and, uh, and animals do just fine. So somehow, the animal brain and body, the computational uh, capacity that is encompassed in the animal brain and body is sufficient to build a model of the physical world that supports the level of functionality that we want our robots to have. So the animal brain and body don't need internally to represent the universe at, um, at, at, at full, full fidelity, because they can't. They also don't have the same computational power as the universe itself. So somehow, whatever is relevant about the universe, whatever needs to be represented about the universe in order to function in it, uh, can be supported by the computational capacity of a finite system with constant computational uh, complexity, namely the animal uh, brain and body. The line of work that I will present uh, today concerns legged locomotion, a core problem that has been um, a, a main uh, stay in robotics uh, for decades. And this entire line of work was done in collaboration with Marco Hutter at ETH Zurich and several generations of PhD students that Marco supervised at uh, ETH Zurich. And working closely with Marco and his students has been one of the most gratifying experiences of uh, my career. Our collaboration has been incredibly successful and I put a little golden halo around Marco's image on this slide uh, to indicate that uh, he is such an amazing uh, collaborator. And I recommend collaborating with him to anyone who, uh, who can. The first significant work came out of our collaboration, which we initiated about six years ago, is this paper in Science Robotics where we showed that by training in simulation, we can get robots to perform dynamic maneuvers in the physical world that were out of reach of all prior controller design and controller learning methodology. Namely, incredibly contact-rich uh, maneuvers that involve unscripted and essentially arbitrary sequences of contacts, initiating and breaking contacts with uh, the environment that no prior control design methodology could support. Here's an example. So the robot can fall down, essentially, in any uh, configuration, and then uh, stand up 
and recover from any configuration. It could also do all the standard things like walk around and run around. Uh, but these contact-rich uh, rollover and, and recovery maneuvers were the most, the most striking things uh, about this work that no prior methodology could really, uh, could really convincingly accomplish. Um, by the way, this is the last project in which we allowed uh, the PhD students to uh, kick the robots. After this, we instituted a complete moratorium on kicking the robots. If any robots are watching a recording of this talk, uh, we apologize. We have seen the error of, uh, of our ways, and we never kicked robots ever again. Um, so uh, the controller that was trained uh, in simulation was already at this, this stage, and this was, this was 2019, ancient history and deep learning years, um, was successful in essentially 100% 100, 100 uh, of the cases, as in uh, the robot could be, could be put in any configuration and it would, uh, it would recover by rolling itself over. And what's interesting here, again, is that contacts could occur at any point uh, on its body in any, in any sequence. And if you worked in robotics, uh, in robotics back then, um, you would know that all controller design methodologies at the time, if they involved changing gates, um, they involved uh, really tricky, discrete, continuous optimization uh, methodologies uh, that were really quite limited and often broke and often didn't, uh, didn't converge and couldn't produce anything near this level of robustness on physical systems. How did we do this? Uh, well, first, we did not attempt to do the classic discrete continuous uh, optimization, um, we just did model-free reinforcement, uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, that gave us much more freedom in the representation of the controller and crucially in the optimization. We didn't need to fit it into uh, a classic analytical uh, optimization framework. And second, we trained this thing uh, in simulation. So. We represented the robot as an articulated rigid body. And um, we executed a fairly, fairly standard, fairly basic reinforcement learning uh, training loop where a neural network policy um, that received the, uh, the current state of uh, this articulated rigid body uh, produced, uh, produced uh, actuation. Uh, for uh, for the joints, the series elastic joints at uh, the series elastic motors at the joints, and that actuation was applied uh, to the robot, and you would uh, repeat, and we gave a reward uh, in the simulated in the simulated world, where, for example, the robot would would stand up uh, from uh, from some uh, some configuration. We uh, executed this um, program that you can see in the top path in this slide and put it on the physical robot, and it didn't work. Okay, And it didn't work for about half a year. Uh, and Jimin, the main PhD student working on, on this project, basically struggled uh, for, for half a year. And it is a testament to his perseverance and, and also insight that he didn't give up. The reason it didn't work uh, is that there was tricky dynamics in the system that was not represented in the simulator. In particular, uh, there were really weird unmodeled delays uh, and uh, nonlinear relationships in the actuators, the series elastic actuators uh, that actuated the joints of uh, the robot. So in simulation, um, you, you have kind of a, a simulated 
simulated uh, motor and, and you give it a command to contract to execute a certain torque and it executes that torque. But in reality, it goes through uh, some software, uh, it goes through some hardware, the behavior of the actuator has weird delays. The delays are not constant. They can change with time. They can change as a function of uh, the state of the robot and the state of the actuator. It depends on the voltage of uh, the battery. And there are all sorts of uh, weird phenomena that uh, broke policies trained in, uh, in simulation. What finally made it work is that uh, Jimin represented the actuator itself as a neural network uh, that was, was trained in the physical world. This is an advanced form of system identification. He basically trained a function approximator that modeled the actuator and modeled all these unmodeled uh, phenomena that we didn't account for in our simple analytical actuator, uh, actuator model. Uh, so the input was the state, um, uh, the, uh, the, the state of the uh, actuator and, uh, and the command. And the output was the actual joint torque produced by the actual actuator. And that little function approximator could be trained, could be tuned, just by taking the physical robot and basically giving it random commands and perturbing it and shaking it, shaking it around and seeing what the actual empirical relationship was between the command sent to the actuator and the torque that, the, that this physical actuator actually, uh, actually produced. With this advanced system ident identification, you put it back in simulation and put that little model in the simulated joints of uh, the simulated robot, this empirical noise model uh, of the actuator, and train the control policy, and then it works. Then you can take the policy trained in simulation, put it on the physical robot, and everything goes. Through. This brings up the first design pattern uh, for uh, training in simulation and being successful uh, in harnessing simulation in robotics. And the design pattern is that you iterate. Um, you don't just design a simulation, sort of open loop. You think, oh, I'm an experienced simulation designer. I will design a simulator. I know what I need to simulate. You train a policy in simulation deploy it on the physical system, uh, and uh, you observe unmitigated glorious success, and, uh, and you call it a day. It doesn't quite work that way. What actually happens is that there is an outer loop where you design the simulation, you train a policy in simulation, you deploy it on a physical robot in the physical world. It usually doesn't work the first time around. Um, and then you analyze what did not work? Why could, uh, why did it not work? Why did it break? It usually broke because of some gap uh, between your simulation and the physical world. And finding a way to bridge that gap, what is that missing element? What is that missing uh, element of fidelity in your, uh, in your simulation that you need, uh, you need to close? You estimate that correctly, you close, uh, you close that gap, train the, uh, retrain the policy, and, um, uh, and iterate. Uh, that, uh, that work quite, got quite a bit of attention. It was recognized as, uh, as an important step. Uh, Hod Lipson wrote a nice article in, uh, in Nature um, uh, announcing this, describing, uh, describing this advance. And later in the year, Nature selected it as uh, one of the remark 10 remarkable papers uh, from uh, 20 2019. The second significant paper that I want to highlight in this line of work was published in October 2020 
uh, also in science robotics, uh, and it was on learning quadrupedal locomotion over challenging terrain. And I think this is the most important uh, paper I'm presenting today. So this, this paper really, uh, really has the strongest, uh, the strongest message that's probably the central message of my talk. And what we did here was train robots in, uh, in simulation and then deploy them essentially in arbitrarily complex uh, natural environments that far exceeded the complexity of our simulations. So let me show you uh, some results, and then I'll show you the simulation that, uh, that these robots were, were trained on, and we'll talk about what happened. Enables robots to traverse challenging environments that have been unapproachable by existing methods. The proposed controller is driven by a neural network policy that is trained in simulation and deployed on different versions of the animal robot. Without any real-world data or accurate terrain models, the control policy is robust in natural environments with highly irregular terrain profiles and unknown physical properties such as friction and compliance. To evaluate robustness and generalization, we tested under various conditions and with different robots over the time frame of more than half a year. The proposed method does not use cameras, LiDAR, or contact sensor information, but only relies on proprioceptive sensor signals to adapt to diverse terrain conditions. The controller can handle dynamic footholds. remains robust even when the robot's feet are impeded, and successfully handles significant disturbances to the robot's legs which are often present when walking through vegetation. In fact, our system was able to traverse any terrain shown in this video without a single fall. For each robot, the same controller was used in all environments and condition. Okay, so you see here wildly non-rigid terrain. Uh, you see deformable media, granular uh, media, mud, snow, um, gushing water, you know, fluids, fluids galore, overground uh, obstruction. Here's the simulation uh, that this thing was trained in. It only had rigid terrain. There was no compliance no deformation whatsoever. ...in simulation to follow a command direction on rough terrain. In every training episode, a new environment is synthesized and external disturbances are applied as the robot learns to remain stable and maintain the desired heading. Training is done in two steps. We first train a teacher policy that has access to privileged information from simulation. With ground truth knowledge of the environment, the teacher learns adaptive locomotion skills through reinforcement learning. The trained teacher policy is then distilled into a TCN student policy, which is used for deployment on the physical machine, where privileged information is not available. Training is conducted on three types of parameterized terrains, hills, steps, and stairs. Throughout the training process, the terrain parameters are adapted depending on the performance of the policy, such that they remain challenging, but traversable. This is achieved through the use of a particle filter. Okay, so there is the empirical finding that you can train in qualitatively simpler simulation than the environments you deploy in and really achieve basically unqualified success in those, uh, in those environments. Uh, the robots that we trained basically had a 100 success rate. We got to a point where we just couldn't make them fall, with some exceptions that I'll talk about in the context of the ne next work. Uh, essentially, the robot is blind. Uh, so the robot only has proprioception. It does not have, quote unquote, remote sensing. It doesn't actually see the environment. In advance, what that means is, for example, if you command it to walk off a cliff, it will, right? So if you kind of walk it, if you drive it into a pit 
or a crevasse or, uh, or off a cliff, yeah, it will fall and die, uh, or the robot equivalent of, uh, of, uh, of dying. Um, but uh, short of anything dramatic, dramatic like that, um, it, you basically couldn't, couldn't make, it, uh, make it fail in any environment uh, we, uh, we deployed it in. And, and that message will be, uh, will be further reinforced in other uh, demonstrations that I will show you and in the next work uh, that, uh, that, that I will show you. Uh, some intuition, I mean, uh, you, you, you should build your own mental model about why. Why is that? How is it possible, uh, right? Some intuition is basically just by slipping on rigid terrain and being perturbed by external forces on rigid terrain is enough stimulus uh, for the robot to learn to be robust. So it doesn't need to be perturbed due to kind of grass it's walking through. It doesn't need to slip because the terrain kind of crumbled or there is compliance in the terrain. It's OK for it to kind of slip um, because of, uh, of, of slippage because of uh, insufficient uh, traction, uh, because, of, uh, because of the certain, certain friction properties of rigid terrain uh, that it is walking on. And we actually, turns out, don't need to simulate all the tricky things that we are not good at uh, simulating. So this was somewhat surprising to basically everyone who worked on, uh, on this project. This is kind of w something that we, and I think the rest of the field, uh, learned uh, at, uh, at, at this point. Beyond this, um, there are a few, uh, a few technical tidbits uh, of, uh, of this work that are, uh, that are maybe interesting uh, and kind of occupy the bulk of the, of the paper. The, the bulk of the paper real estate was devoted to other things. And let me briefly, briefly walk, you, walk you through them. So first, uh, there is this idea of uh, privileged, privileged learning. That, uh, that I will dwell on a little bit. We decomposed uh, the training process into two stages. And this really takes advantage of training in simulation. The thing is, when you train in simulation, you can do precisely what Rod Brooks told you not to do, which is you can cheat. You can do things that you can only do in simulation. For example, you can tap into the ground truth state of the world. You can kind of take, uh, take the lid off the simulator and peek into what is the ground truth state of the robot? What is the ground truth geometry of the terrain? Uh, is a particular um, leg in contact with, uh, with the ground? Um, what are the friction coefficients of the material? You can take all the uh, forbidden ground truth knowledge uh, about the robot in the world that you can never estimate accurate, accurately in the physical world and feed it uh, to the policy. So you train a privileged teacher policy that just unabashedly, unapologetically cheats. Uh, this policy basically assumes that perception is solved, uh, is solved to a completely unreasonable level. But what this policy does is it learns to act. Given perfect ground truth perception of the environment, it learns how you uh, can successfully actuate the physical uh, system to accomplish your goal. Then, basically, in any state, you have a successful policy that actuates the robot. What we do then in the second stage is strain a student policy that doesn't cheat, that only uses the same input that would be available and at the same fidelity that would be available on the physical system. So it doesn't get to peek into the ground truth geometry of the terrain. It doesn't get to know whether you're in contact or not with perfect accuracy. It doesn't get the material properties of the terrain, uh, and so on and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So it only gets the same input that the physical system gets. Um, but it has an incredible teacher. It has a teacher that knows exactly what to do 
at any point in time. In any state, the teacher policy already learned to act. So we essentially decompose the training problem into learning to act and learning to perceive. Okay, Learning to act as human perception is perfect. And then learning to perceive, but is in, with incredibly good supervision uh, with a teacher that already knows what to do in any state. So that's the first uh, cute idea uh, that, uh, that I will elevate into a kind of general design pattern, because we've used it again and again and again uh, in multiple uh, lines of work. Second cute idea at the time was, um, was to use a, and uh, what was at the time regarded as a non-trivial model uh, with a non-trivial history. So believe it or not, uh, the standard at the time was to represent policies with uh, multi-layer perceptrons that just took the input from maybe the current time step and maybe two previous uh, time steps. Those models were derived basically from the PDEs that classic controllers uh, were integrating. Uh, so classically, controllers were represented as partial differential equations uh, that had up to second order terms. So to evaluate a, sec uh, a second order term, you just need the previous two time steps. Uh, the machine learning revolution in robotics at that point was, hey, instead of integrating an analytical PD, let's just feed the same input to a multi-layer uh, perceptron and uh, train it end-to-end. -end. It's a more powerful function approximator. It will work better. And it did. And that's actually what we did in our previous work. So the first science robotics paper I showed you had that kind of model. In this model, um, we, uh, we took a more powerful model that can uh, effectively um, uh, attend to much longer history. So we, uh, we used a TCN, a temporal convolutional network, fed it two seconds of, uh, of, of history, so on the order of 100, uh, 100 time steps. Um, with our frequency. And that was actually important um, because remember, the robot is blind. At this point, we didn't have any, any visual perception or anything like that. So it's basically feeling out the environment with its body. It knows it's slipping only by realizing that it's slipping. Um, it knows that the terrain is crumbling underneath it because just because it senses its own state through time. Okay, I mean, it doesn't know semantically that the terrain is, uh, is crumbling, but it essentially implicitly infers that something like this uh, is happening. So to integrate enough, enough information to make these, uh, these inferences, uh, this longer history proved to be important. Um, the third uh, cute idea uh, was this automatic curriculum tuning. Um, you saw some of that in the video. Essentially, the idea is to, to ramp up the difficulty of the terrains, the environments that, uh, that the policy is trained on, adaptively depending on the level of success of the controller. So we started out with essentially flat terrains. It just learns to walk on flat ground. And we gradually make the terrain a little bit more difficult. The steps are a little bit um, a little bit higher. Um, we hold that level until until the controller gets to a certain uh, certain level of robustness. We step up the dif uh, difficulty more and more and more, and we don't do that on an analytical schedule. So this is done adaptively, um, tuned to the level of performance uh, automatically of the controller uh, that is being. Trained. That's another factor um, that enabled successful, uh, successful training of this policy. Basically, if we started it out with maximally hard terrains that we needed it to deal with by the end in order to be as robust as it ended up being in reality, it wouldn't train. Uh, we, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't make the training work. This auto, uh, adaptive cur curriculum proved to be important. So here is a, uh, a graphical illustration, kind of a schematic illustration of this privileged learning uh, design pattern. Um, we actually wrote a whole paper sort of uh, 
uh, analyzing uh, this this uh, this methodology and its advantages and disadvantages and uh, and and why why it works uh, and why it's why it's a good idea. We called it learning by cheating. Um, roughly, uh, you train as a, as uh, as we discussed a teacher policy that cheats that peeks into privileged information that's really only available to you because you're in simulation. Uh, then we distill that. We use that teacher as a teacher uh, for a student policy that only gets fair game input that's, only, uh, that's also present in the uh, on the physical system. And the student policy is what we transfer to uh, the physical uh, system. Let me show you some uh, more examples um, of uh, terrains and environments that are just obviously different, uh, qualitatively different from the environment uh, that the policy was trained in, which were completely rigid. All set of rigid terrains and simulation, the learn control policy is robust to dynamic footholds and deforming surfaces. The robustness of our controller has been validated on outdoor terrains with characteristics that have never been encountered during training. The controller successfully handles dramatic variation in surface materials and terrain profiles. All right, so turns out you can go from this to this. Now, as I mentioned, this uh, policy, this robot was uh, was blind. And another, actually, pretty interesting empirical uh, empirical finding from this work is that blind, purely proprioceptive uh, policies, purely proprioceptive systems, can be as robust uh, as they ended up being. But they weren't. Perfect, actually. So first, you could definitely drive this thing off a cliff because it wouldn't be able to see uh, to see the cliff in advance. But even short of anything dramatic like that, it had to feel out the environment with its body. It couldn't anticipate uh, particularly effective footholds. Uh, it couldn't really anticipate in advance that now it's going to go onto a nice solid flat patch so it could speed up and adjust its, ga uh, its, its gait in, uh, in advance. And even when it was on a, on a nice flat solid patch and maybe it could start running, it didn't really know how long it can keep running. Maybe it would run right into uh, into mud. So it, it it developed this very cautious, sturdy, robust gait, and it was definitely not as fast uh, as a robot with sight uh, could uh, could be. So in our in our next work. Uh, we, we gave this thing visual perception and basically instantiated this whole program in a robot with a uh, visual uh, sensor constellation that could actually see its environment, which enabled it to be as robust uh, uh, as what you saw in the previous work, but also much more effective, and it, it was just much faster. Um, so this, this was published in Science Robotics in January uh, 2022. Let me show you some results and maybe walk you through uh, some key ideas in, in this work. Receptive locomotion controller for quadrupedal robots that combines fast locomotion and exceptional robustness on challenging terrain. The controller successfully traversed a variety of challenging natural and urban environments over multiple seasons with the same locomotion policy used for all deployments. It conquered loose terrain, stairs and obstructing fog, difficult hiking paths, and many more, which pose great challenges for perception and locomotion without a single failure. OK. The key idea here really was, was, was a modeling uh, idea. Uh, we introduced a, an encoder. Uh, that combined uh, input from proprioception and exteroception in a way that allowed the policy under the hood to
to discount exteroception when it wasn't reliable. The key challenge was that with the sensor constellation we had, which involved uh, LIDARs, active, active depth, uh, depth sensors, the exteroceptive input was often misleading. So for example, when this thing would walk through uh, thick vegetation, uh, the lighters would produce returns uh, from the surface of the vegetation. So it would look like the, 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 the height of the ground was at the upper envelope of, uh, of the vegetation. But that was not true in practice. When the robot would step on the vegetation, the, uh, the, um, the leg would, would penetrate uh, this apparent uh, apparent, uh, apparent surface, and the robot needed to adapt to that. So it couldn't really trust its model of the environment provided by, uh, by the lighters too much. So this architecture has basically uh, an uninterrupted path from proprioception to, um, to the uh, state estimate maintained um, by the controller uh, that that is always there, and with this attention-based gate uh, that is trained in simulation, the controller can always basically fall back on proprioception. It can detect when uh, the world isn't behaving in concordance with the model uh, that is provided by the visual sensors, in particular, in particular by the lighters and it can basically fall back uh, on proprioception and on the cautious and robust gait uh, that, uh, that it, uh, it, it knows how to maintain with blind proprioceptive input alone. So essentially, this thing was architected to be at least as robust as the blind proprioceptive controller uh, developed in the previous work. So ideally, at its best, what happens is when visual input is reliable and uh, the, uh, in particular, the returns from the LIDAR uh, are, um, are, uh, are in, in alignment with, with the true geometry of, uh, of, of the environment, then the robot can locomote faster uh, and more confidently through the environment. But when something starts happening that disagrees with its representation of the geometry of the environment, it, it will not be less robust. It will just fall back on the blind proprioceptive um, policy. With that, we accomplished what I think is another um, notable uh, result in, uh, in, in robotics, which is the robot went on an hour-long hike uh, on an existing hiking path in the Alps designed by humans for humans, not instrumented or modified in any way, and did an hour-long hike on a marked hiking trail in the Alps at the, at the recommended time for humans. So let's on the Etzel okay. Mountain in Switzerland to test if the robot could complete an hour-long hike up and down the mountain. The hiking loop was 2.2 kilometers long with an elevation gain of 120 meters. The official signage suggests 35 minutes to reach the summit. Completing the trail required traversing steep inclinations, high steps, rocky surfaces, slippery ground, and tree roots. Despite all the challenges, the robot reached the summit in 31 minutes, which is faster than the expected human hiking time. On the descent through a forest, tree roots formed intricate obstacles. The ground was slippery, and vegetation above the robot sometimes introduced severe artifacts into the estimated elevation map. Despite all the challenges, the robot finished the hike without any human help and without a single fall. It completed the hike in virtually the same time as suggested by a hiking. All right. Um, and it wasn't just natural, uh, natural environment. So let me, uh, let me show you uh, some urban, urban hiking uh, sequences. And it is exactly the same policy. So this is exactly the same controller.
All right. Uh, the simulation, as, as you would expect, is much simpler uh, than the physical environments it is, uh, it is deployed. Deploy a privileged training procedure. We first train a teacher policy on a variety of terrain using reinforcement learning. The teacher policy has privileged access to all ground truth information from the simulator and learns an optimal reference motion. We then train a student policy to imitate the teacher policy given observations of varying reliability. The student contains the belief encoder and also tries to reconstruct the ground truth height samples to encourage an informative belief state. Okay. So it's basically the same program, um, by and large, that, uh, that I explained for the previous, previous work. Now, a small note, a small aside, uh, there is something in this work uh, that I just, uh, just presented that I never quite liked. Uh, that never that that I knew was not uh, not quite right and was kind of a pragmatic expedient decision that we made, but is not uh, is not something that that's going to stand the test of time, which is the use of a fairly heavy, fairly elaborate sensor constellation and the representation of the environment. So the sensor constellation on the robot was. Uh, was 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 quite uh, lavish. I mean, there were like two lighters and four cameras, and the environment was represented as as kind of a geometric elevation map. So it it was kind of a two and a half D uh, representation of the geometry of the environment around uh, the robot. Coming from a strong computer vision background, I, I, I knew that that's, that's not quite right. I knew that, first of all, we don't need uh, this, uh, this exorbitant sensor constellation. You know, animals do just fine with two eyes, and you'll be fine with one eye closed as well. Uh, so, so surely we should be able to get by with, uh, with a camera, maybe a depth, depth camera. Um, and as for representation of the environment, uh, that 2.5D representation um, never felt, never felt quite, uh, quite, uh, quite right to me. The reason we went with that is because there was a stack uh, in uh, in the ETH lab that was developed over the years that worked with that sensor constellation on the robot and produced that representation of the uh, environment, and we just used it. Okay, not because we thought it was. The, the, the very, very best, but it was there, and we used it. And one reason to use it was that there was a little bit of time pressure on this project because of something I'm going to show you in the next, uh, in the next slide. So doing this a year earlier rather than a year later actually made a bit of a, uh, uh, of a difference. Um, our friends and colleagues at uh, CMU and UC Berkeley followed up on our work after, after it came out. Uh, and showed, you know, pretty quickly after we published our paper that really this the, the, this this can be done as we expected, just uh, uh, just with a camera. We don't really need uh, two lighters and four uh, four cameras, and we don't need to maintain the simplified two and a half D representation of the environment. Everything can be done, you know, in a, in a more streamlined way that's more compatible uh, with what we've learned about computer vision um, over, uh, over, uh, over the years. So uh, just, uh, just that, that, that note that you should incorporate into your mental model of, um, of this field, uh, this is a useful, useful thing to know. Now, here's one source of uh, time pressure and one outcome of uh, of this project, which is one one independent, perhaps validation, uh, that this uh, this that this really was a non uh, non trivial result. Who enabled autonomous operation in the DARPA subterranean challenge, where Team Cerberus deployed our locomotion controller autonomously over extended periods of time in underground environments with rough terrain and degraded sensing. Our locomotion controller explored the underground environments over 1.7 kilometers without a single fall, helping Team Cerberus win the first prize. So this, this controller um, drove all the legged robots uh, for the team that won the first prize 
uh, in the DARPA Subterranean Challenge, which is one of uh, kind of a sequence of these big high profile challenges in robotics uh, that DARPA has run uh, through, uh, through the last couple of decades. Uh, so uh, there were the self-driving challenges, uh, right? There was, there was the humanoid challenge, and most recently there was the subterranean challenge, another one in these $2 million first prize, let's mobilize the whole community uh, to, uh, to make significant progress on an aspect of robotics. In this case, um, robots had to autonomously explore uh, an unstructured underground uh, environment, a sequence of uh, caves uh, and really tricky uh, un uh, underground spaces that, that were meant to simulate uh, maybe a, a search and rescue scenario. Maybe there is a collapsed mine, some miners are trapped in the mine. We want to deploy robots to kind of map out the state of the mine, maybe find uh, the, uh, the, the trapped miners, maybe bring some provisions to them, maybe help them, help them uh, get out or help the rescue teams get to them. Um, Many of the leading robotics labs around the world participated. This was a massive uh, theme in, uh, in, in the robotics field um, for, uh, for a couple of years. Essentially, the team uh, that uh, Marco and uh, his, uh, his collaborators uh, led won uh, the, uh, the first prize. All of this was done by, by Marco and his collaborators. I personally did not work on the DARPA subterranean challenge at all. They get all uh, the credit. And I think the fact that this, this was the controller uh, that enabled the winning team to uh, win is, uh, is another uh, interesting data point. So to summarize, uh, at this point, I hope to have convinced you uh, that simulation has enabled real breakthroughs in uh, legged locomotion, which has been a core problem in, uh, in robotics for decades. I walked you through a number, uh, a number of arguments against the use of, uh, of simulation uh, that, that, that deserve to be analyzed and remembered. Um, but at this point, uh, I, I hope to have convinced you that these arguments are not uh, blocking. And I showed you at least two um, design patterns for, uh, for simulation that were very successful in our practice, uh, which is uh, to iteratively improve the simulation based on, uh, based on deployments in the physical world that may initially not be successful, but can teach you what is missing uh, in order to bridge the gap between simulation um, and reality, and this uh, privileged learning uh, design uh, pattern that uh, simplifies uh, training and sometimes, often in our experience, kind of shifts training from not working to uh, working for very complex uh, control policies. I will be giving a talk at MIT in a few days. So later this week, I will be giving a talk at MIT that will be self-contained, but will also be a follow-up on today's talk. So my goal is for the MIT audience to get a fully self-contained talk. It will be about the use of simulation in robotics, but it will be about an entirely parallel line of work on agile flight, where we instantiated this paradigm, this methodology, largely independently and completely in parallel over the past six years to achieve breakthroughs in agile flight that I think are as striking as uh, the breakthroughs I showed you today in legged uh, locomotion. Both talks are recorded. And my goal is that the MIT audience gets a self-contained and hopefully satisfying talk, but people who watch the recorded talks on YouTube can watch them back to back and will not have any redundancy because I don't plan to uh, repeat things. And 
uh, we'll have two talks that uh, um, uh, that are quite coherent and and basically function as two parts of a meta talk. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, conceptually, I think uh, that that's maybe the talk that I would have, would have expected to give. So six years from now, if you ask me how this is going to play out, I would say, well, we're going to do a lot of heavy lifting in simulation, but then surely there will be some adaptation uh, of, the, of the controller in the physical world. That's not what ended up happening so far. So far, independently, we've basically substantially advanced the state of the art um, in two significant areas of robotics, legged locomotion and agile flight. What happened in both lines of work um, is that there was definitely learning from the physical world, but it wasn't adaptation of the controller. It wasn't fine tuning of the controller. What it was is adaptation of the simulation. It was things like empirical noise models that we estimate on real data, Say we take the drone, we fly it in the real world, we get an empirical uh, noise model of uh, perception uh, or empirical noise model of the dynamics that accounts for unmodeled phenomena like tricky aero, uh, aerodynamics uh, that we don't model in our simulation environment. We put that empirical noise model in the simulation, we train the controller in simulation, and then we deploy it in the physical world and done. Is that what I would have predicted? Uh, no, I would have predicted that we'll need some adaptation in the physical world. And conceptually, I like the idea of adaptation in the physical world. I don't have anything against it. I guess maybe it will come in uh, at some point. All I can say is that somewhat surprisingly, among many surprising things that happened um, over the past six years, one surprising thing that happened is that we haven't needed adaptation in the physical world so far. Thank you. Yeah, I'm um, just going back to the beginning of the talk. You mentioned like the, the quiet part of the revolution mm -hmm. that uh, robotics has not yet pierced the public consciousness, such as um, like ChatGPT or NLP. So I guess I just wanted to ask, how do you see the future of robotics? Do you anticipate there being a piercing of public, con public consciousness? And then like how many years like, was the time scale for that? I don't know how many years, but I think I think robo uh, robotics has it in it. Um, I think there uh, there there will be uh, there will be advances in robotics that will uh, uh, that uh, that that will capture capture the attention of the broader public. I mean, sometime between now and having Rosie the robot uh, from from the Jetsons cartoons. I mean, when that becomes a reality. I think somewhere between now and then, people will notice. Uh, OK, there will be a Rosie the Robot moment. Um, or maybe something earlier that will, that will kind of have that impact on the culture, where, where the culture will, will recognize, my goodness, robots work. We have robots. Robots are part of our life now. Right? At some point, it will happen. And, and I think it will have be a cultural phenomenon. People will notice. When? I don't know. Hi, uh, great talk. And I have a small question and a big question. So the small question is that like you show this hiking demo, which is really cool. Like how does the robot know which route to take? Does it have like GPS signal or or like environment or planning or whatever? Uh, and the big question following up is uh uh like what like what kind of product or what kind of demo or what kind of application what do you think will be like a ChatGPT moment? Will it be like a household robot or whatever? And do you think those existing techniques can scale up to like more complex domains like hand manipulation or et cetera? Yeah, great, uh, great questions. So uh, navigation is, uh, is something that is not in, uh, in those works yet. It's interesting. It will happen. Uh, it is not here yet. What's happening? Uh, is that humans are giving it kind of directional commands. They're not commanding the, uh, the gate. They're not actuating uh, the joints. They're not giving it detail, but they're giving it direction, okay? Functioning kind of maybe as a GPS level router, 
Uh, okay, so actually, it's it's somewhat more granular than a GPS level uh, uh, level router, slightly more granular. Uh, it's basically giving a direction through uh, uh, through time. Um, yeah. That I, I I think we'll we, we'll get rid of that. Uh, that uh, that will happen. Um, it's it's not trivial, but it's definitely coming and uh, and uh, and coming uh, and coming soon. Very good, uh, very good question. Uh, product moment, you know, what would be that kind of compelling, um, compelling product? I, I, I think it will be a robot uh, that that people will actually want uh, to have as part of their daily life, uh, and will be pleasing, uh, right? And will maybe have also a level of of intelligence that may be, may be comparable um, somehow to levels of intelligence that we detect in, in products like, uh, like ChatGPT. Uh, what form will it take? Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, that, that is, I, I think the product question is, is, uh, is one of the big open questions uh, in, uh, in, in robotics, in that it's, it's sort of clear that if I magically enabled you to build Rosie the robot, that would be an incredible product. I mean, somehow, if you sort of ignore all the questions and all the details, well, that kind of sounds like, like an incredible product, right? Uh, but what happens between now and, and then? What do we do? Is that like the only product? Um, is there anything, anything in between where we are, to, are today? And, uh, in that vague, uh, vague vision, we we don't know. It's an open question. Okay, so how about let's take one more question. Um, <laughs> oh, okay, may, maybe. Uh, Hi, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, one of the premise of your talk was uh, the, I guess, the amount of interaction in the real world versus in simulation. And it's really interesting to see the legged and also the hinting towards the um, uh, the more flying type of interaction. But my question is, why haven't we seen this same type of interaction when you need to do things like pick and place or other um, manipulation of deformable objects, like you said, where the interaction with the environment is more complex? And where yeah. do you see these methods going in, in that direction? Yeah, yeah. So I think that this this general methodology can be instantiated in in manipulation. It hasn't yet. Um, I haven't personally worked uh, to any significant extent in uh, in in manipulation. If you asked me to uh, kind of make a gut call, my gut call would be that this program can be instantiated in manipulation and it can produce results in manipulation that are as striking uh, as results we have, uh, we have achieved in legged locomotion uh, and in, uh, in agile flight. But I don't have any empirical results to back up uh, this, um, this intuition um, today. That would be uh, for manipulation uh, that's maybe at the level of pick and place, as uh, as you mentioned, maybe somewhat more advanced, like like maybe at uh, you know pick and play and placed, right? Like maybe even at this level, I think we can do things like this. If you go beyond that and uh, and and you go to like making a salad, uh, okay, and you take out the cucumbers and you chop the cucumbers and. Uh, and you know you peel the carrot and uh, and, uh, and 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 dice it uh, and and peel the avocado and separate the the avocado pit from the flesh um, of the avocado. I don't know. Um, that's uh, that's another level uh, of uh, uh, of uh, of complexity. And uh, and I think I uh, here I don't have a prediction that's as distinct. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and as confident. Uh, I don't think we're close right now. I mean, I think, I think first we need to get that first level 
of, of pick and place and maybe, you know, pick and play and place, okay, which I'm pretty sure we can get with some form of this program. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll look at uh, salad making. All right. Uh, I know there are still many questions, but unfortunately, we have to uh, have a cutoff. Uh, so uh, let's thank Vlad again for the great talk. Thank you.